Official museum placards still call Tyrannosaurus rex the king of the dinosaurs. Inside locked archives, however, a different story is written in bone. A juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex femur recovered in Montana bears a four centimeter deep bite mark that matches only the jaws of an adult Tyrannosaurus rex. There is no healing. Death was instantaneous. If the fossil record says this, why are museums selling the myth of devoted dinosaur parents? The evidence does more than rewrite Tyrannosaurus rex family life. It exposes a crime spanning two million years hidden in plain sight. The only question left is whose truth survives, ours or the bones? Catalog number BMR P2002.4.1 sits in a climate controlled drawer, tagged and logged. Hell Creek Formation, Montana, 2000. The specimen is a juvenile Tyrannosaurid, the victim in this file, estimated mass 600 pounds and length just over 12 feet. The bone in question is a femur, the shaft still dense with growth lines visible under magnification. At mid-shaft, a puncture interrupts the smooth surface, a circular wound four centimeters deep cutting through cortex into the medullary cavity. The margins are sharp. There is no sign of reactive bone, no healing, no callus, no remodeling. Under laboratory light, the entry wound measures between six and eight centimeters across, matching the spacing of maxillary teeth in adult Tyrannosaurus rex. The impression is not a scrape or a superficial gouge. It is a full thickness puncture, the kind produced by a conical serrated tooth driven with force sufficient to breach fresh living bone. Measurements were taken with digital calipers and logged to the tenth of a millimeter. The entry angle is steep, the wound track nearly perpendicular to the shaft long axis. The depth of penetration, four centimeters, exceeds cortical thickness at this point in a juvenile femur, meaning the tooth did not simply glance off, but embedded fully, crushing trabecular bone and leaving a radiating pattern of microfractures. The wound geometry rules out trampling or invertebrate scavenging. The edges are clean, with no evidence of gnaw marks, rodent incisions, or insect etching. Only a single large-toothed predator in Hell Creek possessed the necessary jaw span and bite force to create this signature. The feature is diagnostic. Provenance records confirm the bone context. It was recovered from a fluvial channel deposit articulated with other juvenile elements, showing minimal post-mortem transport. The puncture interrupts muscle attachment sites, indicating the animal was still fully fleshed when bitten. There is no sediment infill between the wound margins, suggesting the bone was still green, fresh rather than desiccated or weathered. The catalog entry notes no modern tool marks or preparation damage in the region. All evidence points to a single event, a lethal encounter. This is not a healed injury and not a mark of survival. It is a record of sudden overwhelming force. The dimensions, four centimeters deep and six to eight centimeters across, are not random. They match only adult Tyrannosaurus rex. The juvenile femur, once an anchor for running muscle and tendon, now bears the signature of its own kind. The evidence is logged, measured, and archived. The wound remains silent, but the numbers do not change. The next question is not who bit, but how. A precise angle defines the fatal encounter. The bite trajectory cuts downward at 35 degrees, slicing through the juvenile femur posterior shaft. This angle is not the result of random violence or post-mortem disturbance. Vector analysis of the wound reveals a force delivered from above, consistent with the horizontal posture of an adult tyrannosaur standing over its prey. The height required for this strike, eight to 10 feet at the jaw, exceeds the reach of any predator in Hell Creek, except a full-grown T-Rex. Forensic biomechanics reconstruct the moment of contact. The adult tooth row, spaced six to eight centimeters apart, aligns perfectly with the puncture margins. When the jaws closed, bone did not shatter into dry fragments. Instead, it yielded under immense pressure, producing a four centimeter deep conical wound. Finite element modeling shows that such penetration demands a bite force exceeding 20,000 Newtons, a threshold only the adult T-Rex could achieve. The location of the strike, the posterior femoral shaft, targets the anchor point for the largest muscle mass, a choice that maximizes caloric return and disables the victim instantly. Perimortem trauma is established by the absence of healing. Under cross-section, the fracture edges are sharp, 
the microstructure undisturbed by any osteogenic response. In living bone, paramortem force produces radiating microcracks and plastic deformation, both present here. No callus, no woven bone, no evidence of recovery. The attack occurred while the tissue was fresh, the animal alive or only seconds from death. This is not scavenging. Secondary marks provide a feeding sequence clock. On the ilium and adjacent vertebrae, additional gouges and scoring appear, clustered within a 20 to 30 minute window after the initial trauma. These marks lack the depth of the femoral puncture, suggesting a transition from kill bite to feeding behavior. The absence of defensive wounds, no parallel scratches, and no counterbites implies an ambush rather than a prolonged struggle. Comparative analysis with prey species confirms the pattern. Triceratops and Edmontosaurus bones from the same formation show identical bite angles and wound morphologies when targeted by adult T. rex. The method is consistent, a downward bone-crushing strike followed by rapid consumption of high-yield muscle. The biomechanics leave no room for alternative perpetrators. Only an adult Tyrannosaur possessed the anatomical arsenal to deliver this sequence, a fact written in the geometry of the wound and the clockwork of trauma. The chain of evidence links weapon to victim, predator to prey, and action to consequence, all in the silent language of bone. Across the northern plains of the late Cretaceous, the same forensic signature recurs. A clear pattern emerges not from a single bone, but from a catalog of victims. Each fossilized juvenile, each trauma, is a silent witness. The Burpee Museum specimen known as Jane, accessioned as BMRP 2002.4.1, bears the wounds of survival and the scars of intraspecific violence. Four oblong lesions, partially healed, run along the left maxilla and nasal. The geometry and spacing of the marks are distinctly tyrannosaurid, and they mirror bite traces found in other Hell Creek specimens. Jane survived her attack. Others were not so fortunate. At the Los Angeles County Museum, specimen LACM 28471 tells a different story. This is a skull without healing. Crushing fractures and unhealed trauma run across the cranial vault, the kind delivered by a powerful jaw with serrated teeth. The damage is perimortem. No sign of healing. No time for recovery. The diagnostic spacing in the same arc fit only an adult T-Rex. In the Black Hills, three juvenile skeletons excavated from separate layers and separated by thousands of years show matching bite marks on limb bones and vertebrae. The wounds are not random. They cluster on high-yield targets, femur, pelvis, tail. Each mark is measured, logged, and cross-referenced against adult jaw models. The result is unmistakable. The attacker is always a large tyrannosaurid never a Dakota Raptor whose tooth spacing is too narrow and never a crocodilian whose bite leaves a different signature. The pattern holds across geography. Montana, Wyoming, the Dakotas, and Alberta each yield juvenile tyrannosaurids with conspecific bite marks. The timeline stretches nearly two million years from the base of Hell Creek to its final beds. When cataloged, the numbers are stark. Juvenile specimens show conspecific trauma at a rate far higher than adults. In curated collections, the ratio is unbalanced. For every adult T-Rex with diagnostic bite marks, multiple juveniles display the same wounds. This is not an isolated incident or a single unlucky victim. Fossil after fossil accumulates evidence of recurring behavior, not an aberration. The bones do not lie. The signature of predation is written in the trauma, the recurrence across time and space rules out chance. What remains is a forensic pattern that is systematic, repeated, and species-specific. Territory defines survival in Hell Creek. One adult tyrannosaur claimed roughly 40 square kilometers, an area large enough to swallow a Midwestern town, but barely enough to support a single predator of this size. Each day, an adult required between 20,000 and 40,000 kilocalories, the energy equivalent of devouring a full-grown hadrosaur every week. Prey was not unlimited. Annual production in these floodplains hovered near 60,000 to 80,000 kilocalories per square kilometer. Spread across territory, even the richest patches could not sustain more than one apex carnivore without rapid depletion. Juveniles complicated the equation. 
A growing tyrannosaur weighing in at several hundred kilograms needed 5,000 to 15,000 kilocalories per day. Less than an adult, but still a formidable demand on the ecosystem. Multiple juveniles per breeding pair, each with a sharp metabolic appetite, created a resource bottleneck. Every juvenile represented not just potential future competition, but an immediate drain on prey reserves. Population models scaled from modern carnivores reveal the shortfall in stark arithmetic. A single adult and three offspring would require up to 70,000 kilocalories daily, more than the land could reliably provide. The math does not favor sentiment. In years of poor rainfall or prey scarcity, the deficit sharpened. Starvation risk increased exponentially with every additional mouth. Energy budgets leave no room for moral preference. When the carrying capacity is breached, adult survival becomes the only currency that matters. Evolution rewards individuals who maximize genetic persistence, not those who nurture at their own expense. In this context, cannibalism is not an aberration, but an adaptive response. Modern analogs reinforce this calculation. Polar bears, lions, Komodo dragons, crocodiles, all resort to infanticide or juvenile predation when resources tighten. For tyrannosaurids, the fossil record and ecological arithmetic converge on the same verdict. The adult is not a monster, but a rational calculator, allocating calories where they ensure survival. In Hell Creek, nature enforced its own accounting. Every bite, every kill, every vanished juvenile reflected a ledger that could not be ignored. Behind the glass, museum halls present a curated version of prehistory. Towering skeletons, dramatic murals, and plaques that hint at life and death, but rarely at the full spectrum of violence. In the storage vaults, the story is different. Accession records at major institutions list juvenile tyrannosaurids with trauma that never reaches the exhibit floor. The American Museum of Natural History holds multiple juvenile tyrannosaur specimens logged with large tooth punctures and gouges. Six catalog entries with marks consistent with conspecific attack. None are displayed. The Smithsonian's paleobiology collections include four juveniles with recorded predation trauma, all shelved in research archives. The Field Museum's SU exhibit, despite referencing published studies on T-Rex injuries, omits any mention of cannibalism in its public materials. When asked about this absence, one veteran curator speaking off the record described the institutional calculus. It doesn't test well with donors. This selective storytelling is not accidental. Internal surveys conducted by museum education staff show a clear pattern. Nearly three quarters of adult visitors expect to see stories of nurturing or at least neutral dinosaur families. Only a small minority anticipate evidence of infanticide or cannibalism. That preference shapes not just exhibit text, but the selection of which fossils are brought out of storage. Gift shop merchandise and educational materials reinforce the sanitized image with T-Rex family figurines, children's books showing parental care, and lesson plans that skip the more brutal aspects of predator behavior. Meanwhile, the bones remain in drawers, accession numbers, and pathology notes quietly contradicting the public myth. The gap between what is known and what is shown grows wider with each new fossil logged. The institutional record, when read in full, reveals a pattern of omission that aligns less with scientific uncertainty and more with the economics of visitor comfort and donor approval. The violence of Hell Creek is preserved in bone, but edited out of the story told on the museum floor. Lines drawn on a late Cretaceous map do not exist for the animals themselves, but the evidence for territorial boundaries is written in bone. In Hell Creek, the concentration of juvenile remains is not random. Dispersal age for tyrannosaurids was six to eight years, and subadults were forced out of parental territories crossing into contested ground. These borderlands, often near water sources or seasonal channels, became natural killing grounds. Taphonomic analysis of bone beds, including the specimen catalog UCMP118742, reveals a pattern. Three juvenile tyrannosaurids appear at different stratigraphic levels, all within a narrow corridor adjacent to an ancient riverbank. The spatial clustering is not the product of a single catastrophic event. Instead, it indicates repeated use of a site for predation. 
The bones show minimal transport, little weathering, and articulation consistent with death in place. Not the scattered debris of a flood, but the residue of ambush. On these sites, the diagnostic marks recur. Punctures and gouges on femora, pelves, and caudal vertebrae match the spacing and force attributed to adult tyrannosaurids. The absence of healing combined with sharp fracture edges and lack of scavenger modification points to perimortem trauma. In several cases, the bite marks interrupt growth zones, confirming the animals were alive at the time of attack. Each skeleton becomes a data point in a spatial model where mortality is highest, where territories overlap, and where juveniles are most exposed during dispersal. Population modeling requires that 60 to 70 percent of juveniles never reach adulthood. The fossil record in these border zones supports that grim arithmetic. High-density bone beds clustered near ancient water sources preserve not just the victims, but the ecological logic of the system. The landscape itself becomes an accomplice, neutral corridors transformed into killing fields by the demands of territory and survival. The evidence is not hidden in the abstract, it is mapped directly onto the geography of Hell Creek, one juvenile at a time. Today, museum displays still favor stories that comfort over evidence that challenges. Yet the fossil record refuses to filter nature's brutality for our sensibilities. As new discoveries emerge, our understanding of dominance, survival, and even parenthood must adapt, not just for ancient predators, but for the ecosystems we manage now. In the end, the bones do not care what we wish they would say. What matters is if we listen 